Hi everyone, and here's your recorded lesson about the inspector in an inspector course, Inspector Gore. This is trying to get you to think about what you think about Inspector Gore, as well as what you think Priestley wants you to think about it. Just work your way through this, pausing when I ask you to, and keep thinking hard all of the time, and make lots and lots of notes. So the first thing I want you to do is have a look at these six different images. And which image do you most which image for you most effectively represents Inspector Cool? So have a moment. Is it the is it the ghost? Is it the um judge and the scales of justice? The spotlight beaming onto um the Burlings? Is it somebody who's very obsessed with time? Maybe a ventriloquist's puppet. That would be Priestley, who's using Inspector Gould as a mouthpiece. Or is he an angel? An angel of vengeance. So pause now, decide which one you think he is, and write down why. Welcome back. I think, possibly, what you should do is rank these in order of importance. Which one do you think is... You've already said which one you think he is. Now rank them um, in order of importance for you. So say you think he is um, the scales of justice is your first one, so then you've got two, perhaps Priestley's mouthpiece number three, uh, sorry, number five, and then... A time traveller, number four, so you've got two, five, four, a ghost, one, two, five, four, one, and then I go for three and six. So you decide what order you think you'd put these in, from the most likely, the most convincing, to the least convincing. Pause and do that for me. Thank you. Welcome back. So I think you'd probably agree that he could feasibly be any one of these things. There isn't um, one, any one of them that you think, well, is he's obviously not um, there to shine a spotlight on the Burlings and in doing so, the flaws of society. So that's great. So you, you're thinking about which one of these, it's your opinion, to which one do you think is most likely? And it could be any one of them. Now, didn't use this image. Anybody think that I should have done? It's an old fashioned police inspector from the 1940s. Police constable, sorry. What do we think? Should I have used that? I don't think so. I don't think if there's anything about him that's typical. There is no indication whatsoever that he's in uniform. And it's a particularly, Priestley is particularly vague throughout this. Have a pause and just make some notes about why you think that this image isn't as effective as any of the other six. So pause and make some notes. Welcome back. And I've said that he's not a stereotypical inspector. He's not what you'd expect a police inspector to be at all. So we're going to think about evidence in the play that shows he's not an ordinary police inspector. So what evidence is there already? Well, the six images would suggest that he's not an ordinary police inspector. He's not there trying to find out who committed a crime. Really, is he? He's there trying to find out who um, was... Um, well, he's, he's there to try and get the Burlings to think about the part they played in Eva Smith's demise. So he's not there saying you committed a crime because, after all, we've spoken about this and there is really only Eric who has committed a crime in the play. So... I'm going to show you a whole list of quotations on the next slide. And we're going to think about, you're going to add these to your notes. You're going to choose choose them and add them to your notes. But before you do that, we're going to have a little chat through them. I'm going to talk you through them. And we're thinking about what sort, what this suggests about the type of person Inspector Cool is. And whether he really is, uh, whether all of the clues are there from being a policeman or not. So let's get thinking. 
First of all, we're told that he need not be a big man, but he creates at once an impression of massiveness, solidity and purposefulness. He's a man on a mission. He's not there to ask questions. There is a hint there that he already knows the answers he's going to get. Then we're told he's a man in his 50s dressed in a plain darkish suit of the period. He speaks carefully, weightily and has a disconcerting habit of looking hard at the person he addresses before actually speaking. He's not dressed as a policeman, really. And he's also that speaks carefully, weightily. This this is a very considered person. He's there with a mission, with a, a purpose. Um, and he really is um, trying to see inside the soul of the characters that he's talking to. And he says, two hours ago, a young woman died in the infirmary. She'd been taken there this afternoon because she'd swallowed a lot of strong disinfectant burnt her inside out of course very emotive language and he's there so he tells people he tells the Burlings and Gerald that he's there to investigate this but actually there's nothing to investigate really is there she'd swallowed a lot of disinfectant strong disinfectant so she'd committed suicide so this is not a police matter at all he also says a chain of events lead to Eva Smith's suicide so once again, it's not it's not a crime. It's not crimes he's there to solve. He's there to suggest that um, the Burlings need to understand the part they played in her death. Then we've got, it's better to ask for the earth than to take it. It's a very strong socialist method, a message, isn't it? And we can see here that um, the inspector's starting to become a little bit political. It would do us all a bit of good if sometimes we tried to put ourselves in the place of these young women counting the pennies in their dingy little back bedroom. Well, there's an interesting quotation. Since when were the police ever interested in getting us to empathise with the victims? Or to get the people who committed the crimes to empathise with the victims? He's, he's a, an unusual police inspector and he wants us to think about what we've done he wants the Burlings to think about what they've done and to try and imagine what it would be like to be someone other than yourself. And he says to Gerald, and you think young women ought to be protected against unpleasant and disturbing things? Unpleasant and disturbing, not illegal, again. A girl died tonight, a pretty lively sort of girl who never did anybody any harm, but she died in misery and agony, hating life. Again, no crime there, and very, very emotive. He's trying to make these people feel guilty. If there's nothing else, we have to share our guilt. That use of the we. So he's, imp he's implying that he's part of all of this as well. Public men, Mr Burling, have responsibilities as well as privileges. He's judging Mr Burling, isn't he? That's not the role of the police. They're there to solve the crimes. The courts take over the judgment. You've had children. You must have known what she was feeling. And you slammed the door in her face. Again, um, judgmental, emotive. And he condemns people, doesn't he? He's, he's the judge, jury and executioner here. He doesn't want to listen to any justification from the Burlings for what they've done. And be quiet for a moment and listen to me. I don't need to know any more. Neither do you. This girl killed herself and died a horrible death, but each of you helped to kill her. Remember that. Never forget it. He looks from one to the other of them carefully, but then I don't think you ever will. Remember what you did. And then that famous quotation at the end, but remember this one, Eva Smith is gone, but there are millions and millions and millions of Eva Smiths and John Smiths still left with us with their lives, their hopes and fears, their suffering and chance of happiness, all intertwined with our lives and what we think and say and do. We don't live alone. We are members of one body. We are responsible for each other. And I tell you that the time will soon come when, if men will not learn that lesson, then they will be taught it in fire and blood and anguish. Good night. He's emotive, he's passionate, and he's judgmental. Typical inspector? I don't actually think he is, is he? I'd like you to pause now, 
and add these quotations to them to your notes, okay? Welcome back. Now we're also thinking, we're not, we're not just thinking about what Gould says and what other people say about him, but we're thinking about all of these methods that Priestley uses. So all of these things, they're at the pen tip of a playwright. He decides when people enter. He decides who's speaking, how much they speak, and who they're speaking to. He thinks about when they're going to exit, and he also gets that shift in tone and interruptions and that use of time. Remember, this is a play that is in real time. We see the inspector arrive, he questions them, he leaves, all in the course of one evening. He also, Priestley, has at his fingertips the, uh, his sequencing. He decides what order of events happen and what he reveals and withholds and what information is given to the characters and the audience. So we're thinking about dramatic irony there. And he also decides what people are called. So I want you to think about this. When does this inspector enter? What happens as he enters? Who does he interrupt? Does the inspector have any set speeches? Well, yes, he does. He does at the very end. He has that speech. He also questions people in the order that he wants to. And he shifts his attention from one character to the next. And the characters are questioned in order of the events that happened, apart from at the end, when Mrs. Burling is questioned before Eric. And this is a deliberate ploy by Priestley, isn't it? He, he has um, Mrs. Burling questioned so that she can reveal her um, own judgmental nature and that the father of the child should be punished. We as an audience have guessed who the father of the child is by this time. So there's dramatic irony there. And then also think about the fact that he's called him Inspector Ghoul. All of these things. So make yourself some notes on all of these things. Pause and then come back to me. So hopefully you've looked back through your ideas about Ghoul and added notes about the methods that Priestley's using and how they're going to relate to your interpretation of the character. Remember at the very beginning, you looked at those six less, six pictures and decided which one you think was most important for you, which one you think is most like. So we've considered several interpretations of them, but it's what you think that's really, really important. And I want you to choose one of these three tasks from the list to help you explore your thoughts about Inspector Ghoul. You can either write two paragraphs exploring your interpretations of Inspector Ghoul, consider what Priestley is trying to achieve with this character, and back up your ideas with some evidence. Or you can imagine you are J.B. Priestley, You've been awarded a prize for creating the most interesting new character in literature in 1945. Write your acceptance speech and explain how you came up with Inspector Ghoul and what he means to you. Or third, Imagine you're Inspector Ghoul and you're walking home having just left the Burling household. What are you thinking? Did all go to plan? Are you satisfied? Who are you? Write in the first person and organise your ideas into paragraphs. So I want you to spend the rest of this lesson doing one of these three things. And then please email it to me so that I can have a look at what you've done. Okay? Thank you very much for listening. And I shall see you all later in the week.